Last night, I met some of my former students who are in, uh, here in Stockholm, and I asked them to teach me how to say a few words in Swedish. I said, well, how do you say hello? They said, hey. And I said, no, no, a little bit more formal. And they said, well, just say, hey, hey. So, <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> um. Now, today, we cannot live without the internet and the web, because they have transformed, transformed practically everything. How we live, how we work, how we play. Let's just sit for a moment and imagine life without the internet and everything that it can ena enable. So, no online commerce, no digital media, no social media, no electronic bank transfers, no email. Uh, it is simply inconceivable uh, to imagine life without the internet. And my research laboratory, the Computer Science Research Laboratory at MIT, has contributed significantly to this revolution. Starting in the 1960s, when our researchers invented the first time-sharing computers, the first computers uh, that enabled multiple people uh, to use the same machine at the same time. It was at CSAIL that Bob Metcalf established the foundations of the Ethernet when he was a student there. And today, CSAIL is the home laboratory of Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, and houses the World Wide Web um, Foundation Consortium, the nonprofit organization that establishes standards um, for the web. Today, Tim is passionately working on a Magna Carta um, for the web and worried about the siloing of data in companies. Now, when the internet was, uh, when the web was uh, created, I was a student, and there has been extraordinary uh, development um, since that point. There was truly a revolution. Today, this transformation continues, and a big part of it has to do with connecting the web and computation to the physical world. So, for instance, through mobile computers, um, like the one that you see here, through drones, um, that you can imagine uh, as mobile computers or flying cameras, we can peek into sites that we have never imagined before. We can Google for physical information. This is an example of using our drone to um, do a biological study, to do a whale census uh, in Argentina. This robot enabled us to get so close to whales that we could actually identify them, and to do so without bothering them, because the robot was like a um, kind of mosquito uh, humming and buzzing above um, the whales. So this kind of connection between the Internet and the physical world is giving us tremendous view into our world, tremendous opportunities to learn about our world. So what exactly are robots? Well, I think it's important that we all get on the same page and, uh, and uh, define robots as programmable mechanical devices that can take input from the world through their sensors and affect something, make a change in the world through their actuators. And robots can come in many forms. Robots could be humanoid-like. Uh, robots can be shaped like the drone you saw in the previous movie. Or robots can be uh, of many different shapes. And you will see some examples in my talk today. By connecting robots to the internet, we can extend their abilities, their powers. So robots will have increasingly more memory with the internet connection. The memory would be practically limitless and so will be their computational powers. Um, the robots will also be able to access huge data repositories that will enable them to learn, um, to, um, to tune their activities in unprecedented ways, in ways that is not possible to do uh, with simply onboard computation. And finally, once a robot learns something, the robot can share with the rest of the robot community, with the other robot peers. And, uh, for example, the Japanese company, Fanuc, uh, has used this approach to enable their robots that are used primarily in making cars to learn new skills. And within a training period of about eight hours, uh, they could get a robot to do something entirely new with about 90% accuracy, which is really quite extraordinary. And it's really enabled by the Internet. It's really enabled by cloud computing. 
Here is another example. And in this project, um, a robot that belongs to my colleague Stephanie Telex is learning how to grasp objects by trial and error. So this robot has a lot of different types of objects in front of it, and it keeps trying. Once it succeeds, it stores the, uh, the experience and the program in a database. And then a different robot could take advantage of that. And so when that other robot sees an object the first robot already has seen before, that robot will know how to grasp that object. Now, in my lab, we are exploring uh, these kinds of approaches to, uh, to making robots more capable, to creating a certain kind of a science of autonomy. And a very important thing about robots is how they actually interact with the physical world, how they are able to, um, uh, to physically uh, impact um, objects by grasping and moving them around. And uh, here you see a, uh, an example of creating a robot hand that is very much inspired by the human hand, that is very intuitive, it's soft, and it complies to whatever shape um, the object you're trying to grasp um, is. And it really enables robots to do um, the kind of delicate, in-hand, dexterous manipulation that humans are capable of doing. So um, these are a few, a few examples of uh, robots that can um, expand their capabilities through memory and processing. Here is an example where we give robots access to the world repository of recipes. And we ask the robot, we ask the question, can we tell a robot, well, please make me, uh, let's say, brownies. I happen to really like brownies. And have this robot go to the internet, find the recipe for brownies, and really become your iron chef. Uh, really become a machine that can take the recipe, which is um, written in natural language, um, uh, the kind we would understand, that would take that recipe, map it into instructions that it can execute, because now we have uh, enhanced manipulation capabilities for robots, and then follow the instructions step by step. This robot has laser scanners and cameras in the head, and with that, it can identify the ingredients. It can identify, OK, so it's not the most uh, graceful robot. But it's a very smart robot. Look, it saw that there was a little bit of dough left in the bowl, and it goes in there to scrape it. So you see, we are, <laughs> we are hiking the intelligence of, uh, of our machines. But 20 minutes later, we have happy students, because there is <laughs> right now, you really have to be an expert to create your own Iron Chef robot. But what if anyone could have their own Iron Chef ro robot at home? What if anyone could have a robot at home to do anything they want to get help with physical um, uh, work? Well, um, I believe that the internet can really bring robots to people. And let me spend a little bit of time explaining how. So let's say we have a user. Let's call her Alice. We'd like to give Alice the power to automate many physical tasks around her home. So say Alice wants to have a playmate for her cat while she is at work. Well, to do so, Alice can head to a special internet sites that uh, may have uh, tech support. Let's call this 24-hour robot manufacturing, where equipped with an intuitive interface, Alice can identify a kind of uh, shape for the robot. And once she's happy with it, the store prints the robot, creates a programming language necessary to control the robot, and now the cat has a playmate. So how crazy is this idea? Is it really feasible? Can you imagine typing in your browser, I want a robot to play chess with me, and in response to that, trigger some kind of computation? The first step would be parsing the behavior, so thinking, what would a robot that plays uh, chess uh, need to do? Well, it would need to pick up pieces, move them around without bumping into other pieces. Oops. <laughs> um, OK, so you saw the, the result. The other is, uh, so, so you determine the behaviors. Then for each behavior, you create a mechanism um, capable of that behavior. And then you generate the mechanisms, you assemble the components, and voila, you have the robot that is able to play chess. 
Um, now, this robot was not created entirely uh, automatically, but a lot of the steps in, this, um, in creating this robot can be automated today. So what, what you need to do to make um, this kind of dream come true um, is, uh, is two things. You need to improve how we make robots, and then we need to improve how we design robots. So let's talk about making robots first. This is an example of a 3D printed robot that practically walks itself out of the printer. You have seen a short segment of the printing process. The secret sauce is that we can print liquid in purple and solids in the same job. And in doing that, we can embed in the robot uh, hydraulic mechanisms that enable the robot to actuate and to move. And this gives us tremendous um, uh, progress forward over existing 3D um, printed objects that are inert. So this is the kind of mechanism that you can print as one job and you can create without needing to use hands, without needing the expertise for how you make such complex mechanisms. And so I really believe that um, in the future we will be able to uh, print uh, extraordinarily complex machines that will have their function embedded in the printer. Now, another way to consider how you might make robots is to search for a universal cell, just like we have our universal cells in our bodies. Imagine if we found a universal cell for a robot that could, um, that could assemble and aggregate in many different ways. In this case, you see a simulation of, uh, of this universal cell that is essentially a cube that expands and contracts by a factor of two and can turn a dog-shaped object into a couch-shaped object or anything else. So I spent a lot of time thinking about whether there is, such a, um, there is such a universal cell. And it turns out that while easy in theory, the practice is actually quite complicated. And this is the closest we have come uh, to creating um, this kind of universal cell for robots. So this square, the cube, um, is actually a robot. And the way it moves is with a, with a wheel that, um, that sits inside the robot, spins very fast. And when you break the wheel, the stored momentum propels um, the robot uh, forward. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's a step forward, uh, yet we are significantly far um, from, uh, from creating um, the kind of sophisticated biological mechanisms uh, that we experience. But the robotics community uh, is very much thinking about how um, we might be able to do that in the future. So I gave you two examples of how you might think about automating the making of uh, robots. One is with 3D printing, the other one is through these universal robot modules. And now I want to talk with you a little bit about design, because design is really at the core of whether we can make new machines um, or, or, or not. And so um, we have... Um, worked on this problem, and here's uh, how uh, our design approach looks like. So the user, Alice, might head to this 24-hour manufacturing and say, I want a six-legged robot because that feels right. So the, the, the process is like this. So given this rough sketch for what the robot might look like, a database that has all sorts of components, legs, pairs of legs, bodies, that database is searched. And then automatically, as the six-legged physical structure um, with supporting electronics uh, gets automatically synthesized. And from the search and um, segment and compose uh, process, we create design files that can then, send to, can then be sent to any kind of um, rapid prototyping um, machine, to a 3D printer or to a laser cutter or to a vinyl cutter. Or you could even um, send it to a regular printer, um, the one that anyone might have in your home. Um, so uh, after fabricating this flat sheet, the user could fold it into a whole variety of different um, working prototypes. And then a, a programming interface that is presented to the user in the form of an app uh, can be delivered to the user. So here's the user controlling um, the robot uh, from an app. This user knows nothing about robots, but is now able to control a robot. This is amazing. 
So I want to uh, make sure that uh, I explain exactly what is going on in the system. So starting with a design database that's, that stores all existing uh, designs and it's somewhere housed on the internet, uh, you compose and you segment uh, your uh, design in an interactive mode and then you fabricate it. So the user is able to think about the robot as a 3D structure, but the design is done, uh, is unfolded. So the 3D structure is automatically unfolded um, into a structure that can be easily printed. And the structure is aggregated uh, in a hierarchical way. Now, once the design is um, uh, settled, the user has the uh, ability to modify it, to um, scale it up, scale it down, and uh, to um, add legs and other um, devices to it. And you can see how the actual robot design gets created um, in the background. And uh, given this design, um, the robot is tested to make sure that it meets the specifications. So here is the robot. In fact, the back legs were too short and the robot couldn't really walk, uh, but the user could very intuitively uh, make a, a change. And now there is a design that meets the specifications and can be printed. And um, in a, a similar process enables the user to say something like, OK, it's a six-legged robot. It needs two motors, uh, one for each um, set of legs. And given that, the system can automatically uh, create the wiring diagrams and instructions so that anyone uh, can actually make this robot. The parts get presented to the user, and here's the user in fact, assembling um, all of the components um, to get a fully functional robot um, that can uh, walk upon completion. So this is another approach to making uh, robots, to making them uh, rapidly, uh, to creating get up and go robots. And you can make all kinds of robots in, in this fashion. In fact, these robots uh, in this picture have been all created with the same program, but different parameters. The big one is about a meter long. Um, here is another example that will give you uh, a sense of uh, what you can do by segmenting and composing. So this is an example that shows you how to make a flying car. Now, it's a miniaturized flying car. This is one of my big dreams. Um, and we still have to make advances on the power side. Um, but this robot was created by composing the quadrotor part of a car, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, quadrotor robot um, with the um, legs of a... Um, uh, of the insect you have just seen. And now we have a flying uh, machine. And, uh, and this flying machine can be controlled uh, again by composing the program that allowed the machine to walk with a program that allowed the machine um, to fly. And uh, you, can, uh, you can see that uh, there is actually quite precise, um, quite precise uh, uh, control. And here is the robot that encounters an obstacle and it flies over it. So I don't know if traffic gets bad in uh, Stockholm, but in Boston there are some uh, pretty difficult times. And every time I'm stuck in traffic, I really want this robot so I could um, fly right over the traffic jams. Now, with these robots, a very big part is uh, the, f the actual fabrication of the robot, uh, the actual folding of the robot. And the question we asked was, can you make this robot um, automatically? Uh, and we answer yes by providing a means to bake your own robot. So this robot that you're seeing is actually in, a, in an oven, and it's baking itself into the correct shape. And the secret sauce is in the slide where um, here's how it works. If you make the body of the robot as a sandwich structure with structural layers at the top and at the bottom, and inside you put a layer um, that responds to an external sim stimulus such as heat. If you have kids, maybe you know about shrinky dinks. That's what the material we use is. Um, then by, you can, by, by cutting the, um, the gaps in the top and bottom material, we can control exactly how the robot will fold itself from a flat structure into a 3D structure, we can control those angles. And this, is, um, this shows you um, a cre the creation of our mini bot, origami mini bot, on a heat plate. Um, this robot also gets up and goes. And uh, in fact, not only does it go, it runs. It can move at four body lengths a second. Um, the robot can move on all kinds of uh, terrain. Uh, it can also um, swim. 
and it can carry things, and it can find its way um, through rubble. So this very this robot that is fairly simple to make um, actually has a fairly interesting uh, behavior. Now the robot is controlled because it sits on an uh, on an electromagnetic field um, that is composed from four coils, and by manipulating um, the field, you can get the robot to move in whatever way you want. And when the robot is done with its task, you can send it um, to a recycling bin. Um, so the robot is, um, is actually um, uh, easy on the environment. Now, this idea of rapidly fabricating robots has impact on several industries. And I wanted to show you two examples. One is in medicine. And uh, I would like to give you the, the application, a specific application we call the origami mini surgeon. So take the robot you have just seen. We are going to turn that robot into a swallowable surgical instrument. And one application for such a device um, is in removing foreign objects from your body. Every year in the US, over 3,500 kids swallow button batteries. And these are very um, bad for your body because within a half an hour, the battery can puncture a hole in the tissue. And my students actually um, showed this by buying a piece of ham and putting the battery on a piece of ham within a half an hour, the battery was fully um, submerged. So here's how we can imagine doing incision-free surgery with origami robots in the future. We take the origami robot, um, we, um, we compress it, and we surround it in ice. And we create an ice capsule that is about the same size as the size of any pill uh, the doctor would prescribe to you. Um, then the patient um, swallows this um, ice um, capsule. When the ice capsule gets inside the stomach, the ice melts and the robot expands and um, it deploys. And then using an external magnetic field, we can control the robot to, um, to do a variety of tasks, maybe to remove the button battery um, or to um, uh, patch a wound or to deliver medicine at a particular location, or you, even, you can even imagine using this approach to uh, take a sample uh, from, uh, from the body without uh, requiring the uh, incision. So here we have uh, the robot again. After removing the battery, you see the hole, and now the robot is directed to uh, very precisely to the location of the wound that it can patch. So these are some of the things we can do, um, even with these tiny origami robots that we can create um, in, uh, in such a rapid way. But these robots can do much more for us. It, they can really take us um, to the next level in, in manufacturing. Um, because I really believe that today manufacturing has a big problem to solve. How do we go from mass production to customized production? Robots have already enabled mass production. Robots, computation, and the internet will enable customized production. So what is the issue in manufacturing? Here's the issue. Right now, um, we, use, uh, we use robots to automate manufacturing only for tasks that, um, that um, uh, are fairly stable and, um, and uh, are, are done for products that have long life cycles. So cars fall in that category. But if you look at the, uh, the electronics industry where the product changes every three to six months, like your phone, um, or if you look at the aircraft industry where the products are so complex, you, you really don't have much volume, um, we can't really use automation. So the, the, the level of automation really depends on the setup time for the manufacturing pl um, plant and on the life cycle. Uh, the airline industry, um, spends about a year configuring an assembly line, and um, they don't want to change it uh, for five to six years um, in order to get their investment back. So through the design of rapid um, uh, robots and fixtures, imagine um, changing manufacturing from today's very uh, rigid model to a model where workers could configure and reconfigure the assembly lines when the product changes, the worker could um, absolutely change how that uh, assembly line uh, looks like. So if this, um, if this is possible, 
manufacturing will be greatly impacted uh, because uh, we will be able um, to change the way we think about manufacturing from fixed products to customized products. And instead of making products at the far, uh, at the far side and then distributing them um, through shops, I believe that factories will get smaller and much, much closer to people and the products will be easily customized. Uh, people will still be involved in running the factory, uh, but uh, the products will change from designed in Sweden, manufactured in China, to designed in Sweden, um, customized in your own living room by yourself and fabricated nearby. So how far in the future is this idea of 24-hour robot manufacturing? Well, consider that 20 years or so ago, uh, computation was just beginning to, uh, to, to become um, available to people, and the internet was just, the, the web, I'm sorry, was just being born. So today, I would say that everyone has a computer, everyone is connected um, to the internet. In other words, computation has become democratized. And I believe that just like the App Store has democratized access to computation, the potential for democratizing and customizing physical tasks um, can be equally profound. I like this quote from Mark Weiser, who was a chief scientist at Xerox PARC, and he was also credited with inventing ubiquitous or pervasive computing. Today, the internet is a utility, computation is a utility, and robots could transform physical tasks in the utility and become a profound part of our everyday life. And this will happen soon. Tak, tak. Oops. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, I think we will have time for just one short question, and that would be, is there a cost? If I'm buying my 24-hour robot, will it just last for 24 hours? And will there be a cost? So the idea is to make it affordable, right? I mean, and consider that the first uh, color 3D printers cost a half a million dollars in the 80s. And now they're practically throwaway um, the gadgets. So I really believe that we will be able to do this with um, reasonable cost, and it will not be expensive. Right now, uh, the technologies are one of a kind, so they are, uh, they're not quite ready to be deployed as products. But as the industry picks up, I'm sure that um, this will happen. In fact, the, um, the, uh, there are a number of sites on the internet where you can begin to make designs. Uh, the, there are, um, the level of automation is not quite what I have talked about, but I really see the roots of a movement in this direction. Yeah. Well, it's impressing. Before we you have, leave us... Yes, we have a gift that is uh, very appropriate today. This is not one of your advanced robots, but we are also using robots to teach children how to use computers and how to program. So it's a robot, it's a ro ah. <laughs> but it's, a, it's more of the cute kind uh, that will not cut you inside. I love it. In fact, <laughs> this, is my, uh, this is one of my favorite topics today, to, um, to tell children that, in fact, if they, know, if they learn how to program and they learn how to make things, they end up with superpowers. Exactly. Because they yeah. end up imagining anything and turning what they have imagined into reality, and that I call a superpower. So please encourage your children to sign up for programming and to learn how to make. Yes, here, thank, here. You thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniela Roos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.